Well, will you join me in uh, reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8 this morning. Let's read that together. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I heard about a group of college kids who were experiencing finals week, much like some of our college students will be experiencing this week and in the weeks ahead. And um, this group of kids got so burnt out studying, they decided to take a break and go to a concert that night that was a couple of hours away. Well, they partied a little too much at the concert, and they ended up missing one of their finals the next morning. So they got together and came up with an excuse. They went to their math professor and told him that they went to the concert just to get refreshed for exams and uh, to get a little loose for the exams, they'd studied a lot. And on the way home, they had a flat tire, and no one would help them. So it took them all night to get home, and this is why they missed their exam. Well, the professor said, no problem, just come in tomorrow morning, and you can take your exam. Well, they felt pretty good about themselves. They were going to get away with this until the next morning. They came in, and he put them in four different classrooms. Then he took each one their exam. They were all the same. The exam just had two questions. They looked at the first question. It was a freshman-level math question. It was easy. They were feeling good. It was worth five points. They turned the page. And there was one final question. This one worth 95 points. Which tire on the car went flat? That was the question. Pride is a dangerous thing. And while we believe it will bring joy to our life, it often does just the opposite, doesn't it? It brings misery. In fact, the Bible says that pride can actually destroy us. Well, if you've studied Greek mythology, you may recognize a man by the name of Narcissus. Narcissus was a young man who saw his reflection for the first time in a pool of water. And he was so overwhelmed with his beauty, history shares, that he just kept looking at his reflection in that pool of water. Hours turned into days, days turned into weeks, and... By doing so, Narcissus actually starved himself to death. He died because he could not take his eyes off of himself. When the first four chapters of Philippians, Paul uses the word joy 14 times. 14 times. There's a theme to his writing. Paul wants every Christian to experience joy in this life. He wants every Christian to experience the joy of of Jesus Christ. So this morning we're beginning a new sermon series titled The Power of Joy. There's no greater feeling than being in the joy of Jesus Christ. The power of his joy is amazing. However, that joy begins by pursuing the opposite of pride. Joy begins with humility, having power over pride. Well, our text for this morning is Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start with verses 3 and 4 this morning. Notice what Paul writes to the church of Philippi. Paul writes, do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, values other, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Which leads us to notice first this morning that as a Christian... You start at the bottom, and you stay at the bottom. You start at the bottom, and you stay at the bottom. To understand the power of Paul's words here in Philippians, we have to understand the culture of that day in Philippi. The culture 
that those members of the church in Philippi lived in and experienced day after day. This town, Philippi, was named after Alexander the Great's father. His name was Philip. He marched into the city uh, with his army and, and took over the city. At that time, it was called Crinidides, and within that city was actually a gold mine. Uh, it was a wealthy, prominent city. So Philip said, I want it, and he took it. He took over the city, and he renamed it Philippi. And that city became the Beverly Hills of the ancient world. Rich people wanted to shop there, wanted to vacation there. Uh, the wealthy wanted to be seen there. A Greek his historian would write, Rome was a, was a status-conscious society in the ancient Mediterranean world. But no city was more obsessed with status than Philippi. In Philippi and in Rome, and in fact throughout the world at that time, there was a pecking order, there was a ladder of success, a social ladder, and everyone knew their position on it. All right? At the very top, of course, was Caesar. Now we think of the top of the ladder, and we think of kings and presidents, royalty, billionaires, uh, celebrities, athletes that are successful. We kind of put them up on that top rung today. But Caesar wasn't just a ruler. He wasn't just royalty. He wasn't just rich. He was considered to actually be God in the flesh. So when he would walk by citizens and, or, or walk in a room with officials, they would all bow down and they would say or chant, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. So Caesar was on the top. On the social ladder right under Caesar would have been the senators. The senators. There were 600 senators, and they were the most powerful men in the world at that time. They controlled all the businesses, the taxes, the, the military. Uh, they were on that second rung just under Caesar. You go down another step on the ladder, and you would find the equestrians. These were the men and the women who owned the horses, the main uh, mode of transportation of that day. They were the Henry Fords of that day. They were rich, they were rich. Uh, the equestrians. And under the equestrians, you had the decurrents. Now, the decurrents were the educators, the philosophers of the day, the wise people of the day, the people that people listened to. Now, these top four on the ladder of success, those on the top four rungs of the social ladder, made up just 2% of the society of that day. Just 2%. All right? So now we really get to the majority of the people on the next rung. Under the decurrence were the citizens. This is probably where most of us would have fit in. All right? Citizens had rights. They could vote. They could own land. They also could not be punished or arrested without due process. Under the citizens were the freedmen. And though they were free, they did not have rights. They could not vote. They could not own land. They did not experience due process if arrested or in trouble. And then under the freedmen, on the bottom rung of the ladder, were the slaves. The slaves. Slaves could be punished, even killed, without any repercussion. Uh, they, they could be treated that way because they were not even considered human beings. They were property. Slaves. The bottom rung. So this was the ladder of society, and everyone knew where they fit on that ladder. Now, it's also interesting to note that wherever you were on that ladder, those people beneath you, you just considered mediocre people. They, they were... Mediocre people, nobodies to you. You really didn't pay attention to who was under you on the ladder. Your goal was possibly to keep moving up. So Paul writes to the members of the church at Philippi and basically says, if you're a Christ follower, you start at the bottom and you stay at the bottom. Paul's teaching what Jesus had taught and lived in Matthew 20, verse 25. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. All right, you get that? Caesar lording over, senators lording over, equestrians lording over, on down the line. You know that they lord over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be, what? A slave, your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now there's a threat to living that way, staying at the bottom. And that threat is pride. Pride will try to push you up the ladder. It's a threat, and it wants to destroy us. Satan wants to use it to destroy us. So, to live our lives avoiding that threat, I think we need to know the key elements of pride. The key elements. You know, we live in a culture that screams that we must look out for ourselves, me, myself, and I. And Paul's saying here, that will not give you a life of joy. It will not give you a life of joy. So how, or, or so just what are the elements of pride? Well, we begin with status. Status. This is when we look at things like educated, uneducated, uh, blue collar, white collar, Lower class, middle class, upper class. Uh, we even do this with our gender, male, female. I heard about a young woman who came upon a serious accident. She started to work with one of the victims when all of a sudden the guy in a big truck pulled up and basically knocked her out of the way and said, I've got this, I've had medical training, he said. Well, the lady stepped back and said, okay, sir, but when you get to that part in your training that says consult the doctor, just let me know, I'll be right over here, she said. If we're not careful, status can lead to pride, and it can lead us to think that we're better than everyone else. Another thing that can feed pride is priorities, what we value in our society. I heard this week that the average five-year-old in this country has already received 250 toys. Now, I will not be a hypocrite here. My granddaughter has probably already received 250 toys from her namal and granddaddy, all right? But 250 toys by the age of uh, of five. The average age for a child having a cell phone today, I don't know what you would guess, but the average age, and this is the average because there's younger, the average age is eight, eight years old. It does not take long to notice that we have seen a massive shift in materialism in this country and throughout the world, and it's feeding our ego, and it's giving us this false sense uh, of security. Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, was asked what she believed to be the first sign of civilization. They thought she would mention fire or maybe the the invention of the wheel. To their surprise, she said the first sign of civilization was a healed femur bone because someone had to care enough about that injured person to do their work for them. Even the secular world recognizes what makes a civilization, and it's the caring for others. When we care about others' needs above our needs, and when others care about our needs above their needs, civilization thrives. Marriages thrive. Churches thrive. Communities thrive. The problem is our priorities seem to always get in the way. Our priorities get in the way of us putting others and God first. Let me give you an example. Last week was Easter. We had the largest attendance we've had so far this year. In the bulletin was an announcement for the National Day of Prayer. In the announcement, we asked people to sign up for half-hour sessions to come here to the church and to the church uh, and, and pray, hoping to get the whole, entire day, have someone here in the auditorium praying for our church, our nation, our communities. Uh, well, I looked at the list after church and even looked at the list this morning. No one signed up. Zero out of 268 signed up. Now, I believe some planned on signing up, and some will get to sign up, and some signed up after the sermon this morning. But what did everyone need to do? I think those who were planning to sign up needed to go check their priority list. What is actually going on Thursday? What other priorities do I have on that day? However, consider this, with the division we're seeing in our country, with the lack of faith that we're seeing in our country, with the attacks on anything that represents God, taking part in a day set apart for prayer, should that not be a priority? So here's another love challenge. We've been doing these all year. Our theme is love never fails. That's why we're reading that scripture at the beginning of every sermon. 
We're going to do it the entire year. Hopefully I'll have that scripture memorized by the end of the year if you don't already. But we've done seven or eight love challenges. Last night we went to a concert for, for a fellowship love challenge. We had over 60 people go uh, to Mercy Me. It was an awesome night. But this love challenge is to sign up for the National Day of Prayer. To sign up to pray. Show your love for our church, our nation, those who serve in community by going to God in prayer. And sign up down in the Welcome Center after the service today. In life, don't let an unfocused list of priorities lead you to pride. Putting your wants, your needs before God, before others. Another thing that can lead to pride is pace. We looked at this a little bit a couple of weeks ago when we touched on humility in our love series uh, at the beginning of the year. And we had a love challenge not too long ago, if you remember, to, to take 10 minutes a day for that week and just be still. Well, how did you do on that love challenge? Did you make it a day, two days, the entire week? Are you still doing it, taking 10 minutes a day to just be still and know that God is God? I, I hope you are. I had several people tell me, 10 minutes is a long time, just sit there still, you know? Um, it can be a long time. If you're a little bit ADD like me, hard to be still. You know, it, it, it is. But, but someone said, if Satan can't make you bad, he will make you busy. If Satan can't make you ba bad, he'll make you busy. I think there's truth to that. Because here's the thing. Awareness increases when our pace decreases. Awareness of God awareness of the need of, needs of others, that increases when our pace decreases. Think about it. You can enjoy seeing the, uh, the buildings in New York City, the, the, the skyline of New York City, as you fly in to the city. You can enjoy that. You can enjoy it further as you drive into the city. You can see it in the distance and enjoy that. But if you want to really take it in, you've got to get in the city. Get into it. Walk the streets. Look up at the buildings. Notice the architecture. Smell the restaurants and the street vendors' offerings. And, and listen and, and notice the volume of people. To really be aware of what's going on in that city. You've got to get into the city. 400 miles an hour in a plane. 70 miles an hour in a car. 2 miles an hour walking. 0 miles an hour standing. Awareness increases as your pace decreases. You see, the problem is we like to go 400 miles an hour or at least 70 miles an hour. And we have convinced ourselves that we're aware of what's going on around us, but we're really too busy and going too fast to truly notice. I mean, think about our pace. We drive to work while we shave, put on makeup, text, return emails, eat an Egg McMuffin, do homework. Uh, we've convinced ourselves in this country that multitasking is a gift and a talent and something we have to be good at. And we're hurrying through life, and we're telling ourselves, I'm too busy to slow down, I have too much to do to slow down, which translates to, I'm too important to slow down. And that's pride. It's pride. And it's dangerous. And because we're always doing three things at once, we don't have joy in our relationships, we don't have joy in our occupations, we don't have joy even in church, even in our church. Christian author John Ortberg writes, the truth is as much as we complain about it. The truth is, as much as we complain about it, we are drawn to hurry. It makes us feel important. It keeps the adrenaline pumping. It means we don't have to look too closely at the heart of life. It keeps us from feeling our loneliness. This is why God said to King David, who was going 400 miles an hour, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. God's saying slowing down is it's an act of trust. It's staying on the bottom rung. It's putting God and others above us so that God is exalted, so that God is lifted up, and so that we can experience joy. When we don't slow down, we're saying, we don't believe your promises, God. We, we don't believe you have the best interest in mind for us. When we rush through life, we say to God, I, I don't trust you. But 
But think about Jesus. He showed us how to do life, did he not? Jesus worked, and then what would he do? He would withdraw to a quiet place. Even when he went to the garden that last time, if you read it, it mentions that he's been there quite a few times before. He would work in the public life. He would withdraw in private. He would be intentionally inactive. He would be still and pray to God. Jesus knows, you see, when we do not slow down, we wear down and possibly even wear out. You know, some of us are going so fast, we don't even have time for worship anymore. More and more activities are taking place on Sundays, sporting activities, artistic activities, family activities. We don't even slow down to worship God on Sunday anymore. My two boys did not play AAU basketball because it would have taken them away from church on Sundays. They played in all-star games a couple of times on Sundays. However, they were, they were late. The coaches were told they'll be late. They'll come after church. Now, my two sons are not perfect. All right? I wish I could say they were, but they're not. All right? They're not perfect. They even talk to me about things they need to work on. However, one's been a deacon for three years and is at church every week. The other is our youth director now and is at church every week. One Sunday, Terry Gaston said, it must make you feel proud to see your two boys walking down the aisle to serve communion. And even though they're not perfect, it does. It makes me proud. Being intentional in priority and in pace has its rewards. It truly does. Paul understood some 2,000 years ago the seriousness of status, priority, and pace, especially when it comes to pride. So in Philippians, he begins to direct everything toward Jesus toward being like Jesus. Now the next part of this passage has been said by scholars and historians to have been a, a praise song during the days of Paul's writings, and perhaps he just put that into his letter. Well, whether or not he did, notice how this just flows and directs us to, to exalt God and put others first. Philippians 2, 5-11. through 11, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as, as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see what happened there? Jesus went to the bottom rung. And when he walked this earth, he stayed there. He was a servant. He came to serve. But then, when he died and resurrected, he blew that ladder away. He went beyond that ladder. He went and sat down at the right hand of God. And someday we can go and sit in the presence of of God, if we do the very same thing. So this leads us to notice next this morning the key elements of humility. You know, Paul is saying, or possibly singing here, if you want joy in your life, invite Jesus into your life. Be humble before the Lord. Be humble like the Lord. When you think about Jesus, do you realize by leaving heaven and coming to earth, Jesus said, I'm leaving everything I love, everything I love to show my love to everyone, even sinners. That's humility. Max Lucado writes, you want to know the coolest thing about the one who gave up a crown in heaven for a crown of thorns? He gave it up for you. He gave it up for you. He gave it up for me. So what are the elements of humility? Well, I believe the first is humiliation. All right? We've got to be willing to be humiliated occasionally. I experienced some humiliation last week. Last Sunday when we sang our choir special at second service, my voice was a little tired from singing and preaching and teaching Sunday school. A little nervous, having to do a little solo part as well. And I got to the last note of my little two-line solo, and I forgot to take a breath. And so that last note that was supposed to be strong and, and kind of high was squeaky and weak. All right? You heard it. Squeaky and weak. All right? A little bit humiliating. You know, I went home that day. I was like, I'm never singing a solo part ever again, you know. Humiliating. Then on Tuesday, I golfed in the first week of, of our golf league that I play in in Antwerp. And I got a seven on a par three. And 
uh, we were on another par three, and I was in the position to get another seven. And I looked at my son, Bailey, who's my partner, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't think I've ever gotten sevens on two par threes in the same round before. Well, I still have. I got an eight, all right? I got an eight, a seven, and eight. Humiliating. Then on Wednesday night, I went to Laser X. I helped drive the junior and senior high there to play laser tag. Now, I've played a few times. Our family likes to play it. And, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm pretty good at it. You know, I've had some experience. I went there expecting to kind of dominate, if you will. Well, the first game, my, my gun broke. So I ended up like ninth and last because I had two scores because I had to get another vest and didn't get to shoot. So I was like, well, I'd probably won that time if my gun wouldn't have broke, you know, so I felt okay. Second time, I was in fourth place. I was like, all right, fourth is good, but I want that little sticker that says I'm the champion. You know, they give you a sticker. I want that sticker. Uh, one of the uh, teenage boys, senior high boys, had, had gotten it the first game. I'm going to get it. So I took off. Well, it backfired. didn't work. I ended up ninth, okay? Ninth. Well, then I convinced myself, well, that's not bad. You know, there's, there were adults that probably beat me, and then there were all these teenage boys that were breaking the rules, running around. You know, that's why they beat me. They cheated. You know, tonight's not that bad. But then on the way home, I drove home five middle school girls. And I heard one of the girls say, I got six. I got six. I said, she got six. This 70-pound middle school girl got six. I got ninth. Humiliation, all right? Humiliation. But here's the thing, all right? Here's the thing. If you will allow it, your humiliation will lead you to humility. All right? You know, writing this sermon, I realized I shouldn't have thought a middle school girl couldn't beat me at laser tag. I shouldn't have assumed, assumed that it was just adults and teenage boys who were cheating that beat me at laser tag. That's not humility. It's not humility. You see, the most humiliating times can teach us and lead us towards humility. Think about the, humi the humiliation of Jesus Christ dying on a cross, all right? Uh, they stripped him naked. They made him walk through the city carrying his cross. They threw things at him. They laughed at him. They spit on him. They cursed him. You know, crucifixion today is still considered one of the most humiliating ways to die. So when you try to hide your humiliation, when your fragile ego says no, remember this. The worst thing that happened to Jesus was the best thing that happened to us. It was. The bad part of the cross was, was for our good. So the bad part of your life, the humiliating part of your life, can actually work to the good of others. When you surrender your pain and pride to God and let Him allow you to put others first and help others, do you know what you find? You find joy. Joy. You're not always worried about what you look like and what people think of you. You just experience God and help others and find joy. Humiliation is an element of humility. The other is honesty, pure honesty. You know, the Bible says that the truth can set us free, but that also means a lie can hold us hostage. Uh, I heard something this week that humbled me. Uh, a Christian author said, in this country, the lie is we have rights. Well, if we have rights, then... We deserve something. And if we deserve something, then we can demand something. So what do we do? We go into stores or restaurants, airports, hotels, other places of business, or we drive on the road and, and we say, we have rights. We deserve to go to the speed limit. We deserve to be served the perfect food. We deserve to not stand in line. So then we begin to demand it. Last night, went to the Mercy Me concert, mentioned that earlier, and we heard a kind of a ruckus over to the left and a lady was mad and kind of yelling at the, at the person taking care of that section because something was wrong with their seat. Yelling. It's a Christian concert. And, uh, not really showing Christ, even though I know she was probably frustrated. But that's what we do. We have rights. She bought a ticket. She deserves something. So she was demanding something. And truth be told, I do the same thing. We do the same thing. Now, as Americans, that may be true. We have rights. But as Christians, it's not true. 
When we came to Christ, we laid down our rights to take up responsibility. We declared, I want to be last here so I can go and be up there in heaven. We took up our cross. We didn't take up our rights as Christians. Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City, a billionaire, was recently interviewed in the New York Times. and uh, He's up in his 70s now, and he's realizing that life's short, that even though he's rich, his life's going to come to an end probably within 20 years. And uh, he's starting to think about things. And uh, the, the man who wrote the article after speaking with the former mayor uh, shared these, these words. He said, if you think the mayor has any doubt what will await him on Judgment Day, think again. He pointed to his work on gun safety, obesity, and reducing the number of people who smoked in his city. He said to me with a grin, I'm telling you, if there's a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I've earned my place in heaven. It isn't even close. If the truth can set a person free, a lie can hold a person hostage. Don't let that happen to you. Be humble. Let's finish up by noticing several scriptures. Romans 12, 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Why? Because pride is not a wise state of mind. Humility is wise. And let's finish up how we started. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but to each of you, uh, to the interest of others. That bottom rung, everybody else above us. Humble yourself. Humble yourself and you will find the power of joy. The joy of Jesus Christ. As the worship leaders come this morning, if you have a decision to make, I just encourage you to make that decision and turn your life toward the joy of Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing this morning.